Thank you all. Welcome to the virtual session for uh, hosted by Built Green, House Rescue Examining the Carbon Accounting Benefits of Moving the House with our presenter, Jeff McCord from House to Home. I'm Sonia Eau Claire, the Built Green Program Manager, and I will now pass it on to Jeff who will present today. Hello, everybody. My name is Jeff McCord, and it's a pleasure to be covering uh, this unusual topic that hopefully you'll see by the end of the webinar has some pertinence about all of the sustainability efforts that we're, that we're trying to achieve. I'll start out with my opening slide. Um, if I can advance the slide deck here, hopefully. Yeah, I think I have some Zoom stuff going on over the top. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can get past. Interesting. I may have to escape out of the, sorry, right out of the gate. I'm having some technical difficulties here. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. So um, yeah, so, so this talk is about the uh, carbon accounting benefits of moving a house. One of the things that uh, uh, is in my past is that um, about a decade ago, I um, joined a company called Nickel Brothers, which is a structural moving company that was originally founded in 1956. So uh, with over 60 plus years of, of being in the business, they were actually a green recycling business back before the terminology was commonly used. Um, and uh, so this talk is, is about the, the concept of moving houses rather than demolishing them. So this is, a, this is what we're gonna cover today. So there's a lot of buildings that are being torn down. This is an example of how progress uh, is, uh, it involves the evolution of, of our houses being built, uh, being used for various purposes, and then ultimately, in many cases, having an end of life. And what I have realized from having rescued a number of houses by moving them is that not every house has to actually have an end of life or can have a very long extension of, it, of their life. There is a major amount of waste that goes into our landfills. Um, as much as 20 to 40% of our landfill space is made up of construction and demolition debris, especially in times of building booms. There of course have been a lot of really good efforts uh, with organizations such as King County Solid Waste, Seattle Public Utilities, and a number of uh, uh, waste divisions of major and minor cities around the, the country that have made efforts to, to require a lot more uh, recycling. But it's little thought of to actually repurpose or upcycle a whole building rather than having to disassemble it or crunch it and then try to reclaim as many materials as possible. So what we're here today is to, to look at the concept of a little creative approach, which is moving a house rather than tearing it down. So we're gonna cover the carbon accounting benefits of moving a house. First, I'll start out with a case study that I did for the city of Seattle back in 2008 and a quick snapshot of the results of that case study. Uh, there were a total of 85 tons of waste that were diverted from the landfill. Uh, 49 and a half tons were the foundation with concrete recycling, where the concrete was crunched up and reused. And then uh, about 40 tons of wood waste was also diverted with a typical uh, craftsman bungalow house like this one pictured here. Uh, there were approximately 76 trees worth of lumber or 15,000 board feet that were diverted from a landfill and kept in their, in their uh, current carbon storage category. So they were actually, of course, originally um, uh, cut down and used to build a house. Uh, and that, in effect, froze the carbon state of the trees for over 100 years in in this house's life. And by moving it and putting a new foundation under the building at its new location, it basically extended the carbon capture of those trees for another hundred plus years. 
So it's a very considerable way of protecting the carbon from being used by a low, lower use state. There was a great talk at the recent Built Green Conference in Linwood, Linwood uh, by some of the, uh, the colleagues of King County Solid Waste that pointed out that there are many uses of wood when they are effectively recycled, but some of the uses of wood are actually very car carbon destructive. They are used uh, in many cases uh, by being chipped up and then burned primarily in places like paper mills as a cheap source of heat for the, the processes that they use. And that chopped up uh, wood waste is called hog fuel. So even though it's technically recycled uh, or reclaimed, uh, it, it actually ultimately gets burned and then going up in the form of, of uh, carbon in our atmosphere. So not all reuse methods or recycling methods are good. Uh, it's interesting because um, a house like this not only has its um, carbon benefits, but also, of course, many others that will be covered in this talk. But starting with wood waste diversion, uh, we, we have used that wood or have, have, have originally harvested that wood for the purpose of building um, from trees that were either first or second growth in the Northwest, particularly. And we have among the very best types of wood for, um, for its ability to last a long, long time. And one of the most popular in the Northwest is, is uh, vertical grain fir or Douglas fir. Uh, and it's actually some of the floor joists and, and studs that are in our houses are, are what could be considered furniture grade because the grain is so tight. So it's, it's something that being able to have in its full uh, uh, original harvested state is something that has some really big advantages in terms of its long lasting ability. A typical craftsman home was about 1,600 square feet, which is about 70 trees worth of lumber. The average new house built today is roughly 2,500 square feet, and that represents a further 110 trees worth of lumber, which are used uh, to build that new house. So when you're moving a house, you're actually uh, preventing up to 180 trees from being sacrificed uh, due to a desire to build new. Upcycling 70 trees represents 125 years of your life for your share of recycled paper. That means by recycling one house, you've earned enough recycling karma to last 125 years of lifetime. So you could justify potentially, and this is of course a joke, throwing your used paper out of your car window and you'd still be way ahead of the game with the amount of uh, recycling you're doing by saving just one house. There's a lot of other materials that are also diverted when you move a house. Uh, there, there is, of course, a lot of craftsmanship that has been done uh, to the house. And so that is kind of a, a, uh, an intangible form of embodied energy that is stored in that house. Beyond the wood used in the construction, there are thousands of pounds of plaster, metal from ducts, wiring, et cetera, carpet, laminates, hardware, masonry. And in the case of the Fremont house, that total waste diversion was about 85 tons. The remaining uh, construction and demolition debris, uh, if you were to recycle the, the, uh, the, the concrete, et cetera, uh, is about 49 tons, as I mentioned. Having a thoughtful developer who incorporates the concept of house rescue into their development plans is also a really great thing. And, and the more developers that, that realize that that's possible, uh, they can actually do a lot to reduce their own carbon footprint when they're building new structures. Uh, I think that the concept of urban density is a very good thing. Um, it happens that many of the, the houses that are in our, in our urban neighborhoods uh, are some of the most grand and, and well-built structures. But because of upzoning, they often are uh, subject to demolition because the, uh, the, the commercial use or the multi -re multi-family residential use of our in-city areas, I think rightly so, is, is ideal for urban density. 
But in some cases, those homes can actually be moved either within the neighborhood or if they're close enough to a water location to a, a, a barge landing point where it can be loaded onto a barge and then moved to some lesser dense areas like the San Juan Islands, the Gulf Islands in Canada, Vancouver Island, all in the different island areas and shorelines around our region. So there are a number of factors to consider when it comes to the carbon impact of demolishing a house. There's of course the original cutting of the trees, the transportation of that lumber and materials and the construction vehicles that were needed to build the original house. There's also a significant carbon impact of demolishing the house and transporting the waste to our landfills, not to mention filling up our landfill spaces and eventually having to travel even further for the storage of our waste. Also, like I mentioned, the cutting of the new trees to build the replacement house, the milling, the transporting of the lumber. And one fact that a lot of people don't realize is there's a considerable amount of overcutting waste when studs and other lumber forms are cut on site because they're not exactly the size they need to be for the construction. So as much as 20% is overcut and wasted when you're building a new house. There's of course the transportation of the, the workers to build the new house and the impact of newly manufactured items such as kitchen cabinets, flooring, finishes. And in some cases, those materials are now done with uh, various forms of preservatives and, and uh, other kind of modern building techniques uh, that have a lot more glues and laminates and other uh, materials that are not so healthy especially once they li live through their product cycle and have to be demolished. I also consider a large factor of the embodied energy of a house. And that includes the original craftsmanship. A lot of older houses have a lot higher quality of wood and sometimes carving detail and other elements that required a lot of, of craftsmanship, cove moldings, custom plaster work, thicker and more ornate wood trim, artful staircases, quaint built-ins built and various other things that require human craftsmanship. And they often are a lost art that gets lost when a house is demolished. It's fair to ask the question, how efficient is an old house? And it is true that you can build a house new and have it very tight, and able to hold on to its heat and other energy use um, much more efficiently. However, you can do some small inexpensive improvements to a, an older house to actually improve its efficiency in major ways. So for example, it's been shown that um, older houses can perform favorably new, uh, compared to new highly efficient homes. So for example, you can do blown in insulation in the attics and in the, and the wall cavities sealing air leaks, doing blower door tests to make sure that you're holding on to the air in the house, replacing old, window, old windows and adding uh, insulation um, in various places, like I mentioned, the attic and places like that. Another thing that people ask is, doesn't an older house have a lifespan that's, that goes beyond its use? And for the most part, that is true. There are things that will slowly degrade over time. However, surprisingly, the largest measure of a house's life is actually its foundation. When a house gets moved, uh, the house gets moved to the new location over an excavated locate over the excavated site, and then plumb lines are dropped from the corners of the house, and the foundation is actually built underneath the house, while the house is sitting about a foot or a foot and a half higher than its resting elevation. Then the house moving company comes and lowers the house onto its new foundation. Now that new foundation is much more modern. It's got the proper concrete makeup. It's got a lot more rebar and structural support. It's got tie downs and bolts that tie it to the house itself. Um, it's waterproof. It, it is a lot more efficient overall. So you're actually extending the life of the house by as much as a hundred years or more. So um, because a lot of houses fail based on things like water leaking in, settling, cracking. And so you're basically uh, fixing a lot of those potential ills. One other little side anecdote is that um, occasionally when I have been rescuing a house, 
uh, I, I've seen houses that had a lot of deferred maintenance and some of them have actually had uh, fur lap siding. So instead of cedar lap siding, it's fur lap siding. And the paint has really chipped off a few of those to the point that you actually see the bare wood. And I've been shocked to learn that sometimes with as much as eight or 10 years of the wood being almost bare, that vertical grain fur is able to withstand the water even better than cedar. So it's really remarkable with that old tight grain of the wood, how long it can last and even in adverse conditions. So each house, of course, is different in its size and shape and how it's built. And so there's no simple formula for calculating exactly how much carbon is captured and locked in place with a, a house once it's rescued. But the basic concept is that it depends on the square footage, how many tons of waste are diverted. In the case of the Fremont study, it was 85 tons. Its original car carbon impact of building the old house, which is embodied, not lost during the move, and the carbon impact of building what would replace the old house. What I have advocated for a number of years with various cities and jurisdictions, including a deep dive into the building department at the city of Seattle, which is called the Department of Plan of uh, the SDCI, the, the Seattle's Department of, uh, uh, of uh, sorry, I don't know, <laughs> I can't remember the exact uh, initials at this point, but uh, I've, I've proposed using a, a triage approach that the uh, very first choice would be to rehab a house in place. That's, the, of course, the least impact to a, a house's um, um, changes and the carbon impact. Repurpose it, uh, move it as a third choice, and then salvage and deconstruction as a fourth choice. Demolition, straight demolition, shouldn't even be in our, in our uh, vocabulary anymore. Uh, every bit of the house should be uh, reclaimed and or upcycled to its highest use, in, in, highest use in my opinion. So, so uh, just to kind of illustrate, this is an old map of uh, the city of Denver. And um, over many, many decades, Denver was seeing a, a, a degradation of their neighborhoods by demolition. Uh, they started um, doing some historic preservation in the city of Denver that went beyond the large hotels and churches and public buildings uh, that were being preserved to include neighborhood character. And so there can be codification that will allow for uh, the prevention of what you're seeing here, which is the needless destruction of many, many of our quality structures. Not only do we lose the, uh, the, the embodied carbon that are in those houses, but also we lose historical character and architectural style and all of that. And that's something that I'd like to see stopped. So of course, the first choice would be to rehab a house in place. That's its greatest and um, most impact, impactful change when it's possible prescriptively to, uh, to actually just restore a house in place, then that's the highest historical value and, and materials saving that you can do. Another example is repurposing a building, either moving it on site to make room for construction or as in this case of the Pente Pentageous Mansion on Capitol Hill in Seattle, um, this is a house that was slated for demolition. And through some creative consulting, I had suggested that they actually keep the house on site and make it part of this project. So this was a, um, uh, a, a mixed income development. And they realized that prescriptively they could leave the mansion as kind of a cornerstone to the project. And what a lot of people don't realize is that if they do that, very often that historical element that's kept in place becomes a very attractive thing for people who are buying into a project, whether it's a uh, market rate commercial uh, project or a, a mixed income project like this one. Uh, by having something that has character and style and history to it, it actually adds to not only the attractiveness of people moving into a project like that, but it's financial value. And that's been, that's been uh, repeated over and over in, in a shocking way. Another thing that I've done occasionally is advised when there's a, a large historic house in the middle of a large property, one creative thing that can be done is that house can be moved sideways on the site 
and then a second available site can be made for a, uh, a new construction. So you don't have to destroy the old to build new. Of course, the next choice would be if possible, and the house has no other choice but to be demolished, see if it can be moved. And you can see that even in tight neighborhood streets like this one, houses can be moved down the street and very often can be moved to a barge location if they're close enough. It's not only good for the environment, but it actually can save the developer up to about $30,000 in demolition and disposal costs. One thing that's interesting is that when it comes to certain hazardous materials that might be encapsulated in that house, if it's inside the walls or encapsulated under floor surfaces or in some other way protected, uh, it also can be kept in place rather than being disturbed. And so it actually can help a developer in terms of even the uh, uh, abatement costs of some materials as long as they're safe from human exposure. Of course, the next level, if the house just simply can't be moved for economic reasons, or there's not a lot that's nearby that can accept it, uh, then it's completely understandable that moving on to deconstruction and, and or building salvage is the right step. That should be included in this triage approach. And that's something that, that I have encouraged. In fact, in some jurisdictions, there is a process that's been put in place to at least check and see if a house can be moved. And if it can't be, then at least the developer has done some due diligence to see whether it could be saved in that way. And um, so uh, one um, methodology, and I'll go to the next slide because I've been working with the SDCI for a long time on this concept, uh, would be to actually uh, both encourage people through education for things like tips sheets or, or client assistance memos, but also start to introduce a carrot and a stick. Make it so that uh, developers who do allow a house to be moved would have low or no cost removal fees um, and potentially even other benefits like speeding up their permit process. Whereas those who choose to do a lesser reuse or, or even just a straight demolition would have a higher demolition fee as a result. So those are certain things that I think are creative ways. It can also be tied to the carbon impact and that, that's another potential way to, uh, to actually reflect what the true cost is of, of uh, a house being demolished and put into a landfill. Um, there are certain costs that are kind of hidden from the public, uh, which are the costs of moving it to a landfill and handling it um, in our waste stream. And those are costs that are paid for by other tax streams. And so they're not an obvious uh, impact from a cost perspective. And again, if you can divert a whole house from that process, then you have uh, also eliminated or significantly reduced that cost. I wanted to go through the basic steps of moving a house for anybody who's curious. This particular house is one that in mid middle of August, um, we saved in West Seattle. It's actually a very unusual cobblestone coated house that was built by um, um, uh, a, a very uh, interesting woman in, uh, I believe, the late 1930s. Um, and uh, uh, it's been kind of a, a neighborhood favorite for a long time in West Seattle. And uh, I was part of a committee to, to do fundraising to be able to move this house out of its uh, current land, which is going to be developed into multifamily. And it's now presently safely stored at the port of Seattle for the next couple of years while we're looking for a permanent location. So it's an example of a house that, uh, that historic preservation is also being done. So to do this, of course, it's a, it's a uh, stone facade and that's a little unusual, but um, Nickel Brothers did some strapping of uh, two by 12s around the perimeter to help hold the stone in place. Um, there are also ledger boards that are put along the base to support the base of the stone. Um, in the actual move, I'm sure the burning question is, did any of the stone fall off? Literally only about two or three stones from the bottom um, came off as it was coming off the site. And other than that, everything held together. So there's sometimes additional shear strength that's put around the outside of the house, including 
uh, covering up large openings like windows and doors. And sometimes there is some bracing that's done on the inside of the house but it's not always required if there's a, a, a good set of wall structures that are, that are keeping the house from torquing as it moves. The crew digs down in this case um, to be able to slide the main beams in place. And then in this case, there were also cross beams that were put through to help support it in two directions. The main beams are then slid in place. And then cribbing, which are these, these timbers uh, that are about four feet long and uh, four by six uh, timbers are put in a crisscross form that look like Lincoln logs underneath the beams. And then these hydraulic jacks are put in the cribbing piles and uh, that actually lifts the beams up so the house can be lifted off of the cribbing. And then more Lincoln logs can be put between the gap and uh, then the jack has moved upward again and the process is repeated and that's how the house is lifted. Once the house is ready to move, large dolly wheels and the, the ones that you see at the top are dolly wheels around the same size as airplane tires are put underneath the house in the two rear locations underneath the main beams. They're also hydraulically controlled. So during the move, they can be steered, lifted, they can be, uh, uh, basically, the house can be tilted one way or the other to be able to get over obstacles, and they have brakes as well. So the, that's an example of the cribbing piles, and uh, they're removed once the dollies are put in place. Then um, there is a cross beam in the front called the bunk that's put across between the two main beams, and uh, a, eventually a tractor trailer is backed into place and hooked up to the bunk, uh, it becomes, uh, I guess they call it a fifth wheel. Uh, uh, they, they basically end up having a triangle shape rather than a square. If you would imagine, I know you can't see me very well, but you imagine a square, if it had four spots, it would torque as it moves. Whereas a triangle is a much more stable form and it kind of holds it flat as it's moving along the road. There are hydraulic lines that are hooked up to all of the moving parts. And then the move begins on the stroke of midnight, the tractor engine revs up and the house is slowly pulled off the site and into the right of way for the journey down the road. Moves can take up to four or six hours, especially if they're a tall house with overhead utility lines. The house that you see here is one of the oldest houses in this region. It was actually built by Peter Kirk in Kirkland, Washington. And uh, it was, at the time we moved it, it was called the True Blood House. Uh, which was one of the doctors that used it as an early hospital and doctor's office in the city of Kirkland. Of course, normally the cribbing is not storing the house this high, but uh, you can see that it's, it, uh, depending on the, the needs, the houses can actually be lifted up quite high. And the house can be stored for up to six months or a year while it's waiting for its final destination. Here's a few examples of spectacular moves that I want to show. Um, you can see that they can be moved by barge, by land. In the case of the top example, those are actually self-propelled dollies. So believe it or not, they actually have uh, motors in some of those and the house can move without even a truck pulling it. And uh, one of the things that I do tell people is that houses have been moved as long as we have built houses in history. Back in the earliest of times, of course, we moved large blocks, not we, but the people that preceded us uh, for the uh, pyramids by rolling them on logs, by doing interesting engineering with sand. Um, in the case of the house you see on the right, this one is, um, as Jeremy Nickel was explaining to me the other day, on skids. And you'll notice that the horses are actually walking in circles. Um, they're, they're using turnstiles to pull ropes, which in turn are pulling the house slowly, slowly down the street on skids. So oftentimes when I uh, tell people about my history with house moving, I tell them that in 2006, I ran off and joined the circus. Like the Flying Wallendas, house moving is an uncompromisingly high, uh, uncompromising high wire act requiring skill, safety, and thinking on the fly. Like a circus family, 
uh, a lot of house moving families have been self-taught. Their fathers and uncles have passed on the knowledge from family member to family member down through generations so that sons and nephews and daughters and cousins uh, are taught the, the, the tasks and it's quite unusual how much a house moving family really understands engineering, uh, real world engineering. How does a house behave under various stresses? How, how should it be carried so that it's balanced properly, so that it's cantilevered with the weight at various points? Um, and it's not really taught in engineering schools. One of the examples that I use is a large, um, very old 1909 structure it was one of the oldest buildings on the University of Washington campus called Cunningham Hall. Nickel Brothers got the job of moving that historic structure. And the engineers were so concerned about the weight distribution as it went over the parking garage on Red Square that they required Nickel Brothers to put 23 dolly, dollies underneath the structure. Um, now 23 dollies multiplied times eight, I believe is something like 184 wheels. And uh, Nickel Brothers was concerned about how, much, how hard that would be to keep all of the wheels on the ground. And sure enough, about halfway up the hill, I was, I was walking along with the lead engineer for the project and he kind of leaned over to me and whispered. He said, well, if I'd seen what I'm seeing now with the dolly wheels all lifting up and kind of moving around and being hard to handle, I would have required only half the dollies. So it's a, a testament to how some of the best engineers in the world don't really know what the actual uh, details are about uh, how a house behaves during a move. This is the first house that I was involved in saving. Um, it's a, a classic four square craftsman in the East Lake neighborhood, uh, right near the University, of, uh, University Bridge over the ship canal. And um, in this case, it was up on an 18 foot um, hill. Um, and I figured out that if we used something called skating beams, which are those large uh, beams that go sideways there, uh, to actually use large roller skates to move the house sideways off the hill and then lower it into the adjacent parking lot, which was at street level, that that was how to get it off the hill. And sure enough, that's what we ended up doing. And we were featured on a television show on Home and Garden Television uh, with this house move and many others. We moved it down underneath the, uh, the freeway pilings, got permission from WashDOT to do that, and then down onto a dock um, and across using um, barge ramps onto a barge. And now this beautiful craftsman home is on Shaw Island, owned by a family. So moving on to historic preservation. This is an example of a house that, that is one of the oldest in Washington state. It was uh, a contract that Nickel Brothers got with the National Parks Service, National Park Service on um, San Juan Island. Um, the house was originally, the structure was originally built as an officer's quarters uh, at Fort Bellingham, and it was moved to uh, American Camp on San Juan Island. Um, it was built in 1856, about 33 years before Washington was even a state. And it was uh, a vertical plank style building. So um, it was first moved to American camp in about 1867. And then again, moved to Friday Har Harbor downtown around 1875. Um, and, um, and then Nickel Brothers ended up moving it in, I believe, uh, 20, 2009 or something like that, 2010. Um, it was moved back to American camp by Nickel Brothers and it's now used as an interpretive site. Um, on, on its uh, second location in American camp. So here's another historic building that was saved in Everett, Washington. Some of you may recognize it. It was in the parking lot where Anthony's home port was uh, near the military base. Uh, originally, it was a uh, mill house for the Weyerhaeuser mill that used to be in Everett. And uh, there, here's about a minute and a half or two minute video that shows the moving of this historic structure. Even though it looks like a house, it's actually massive. It's about 60 by 70 feet in dimension and about 50 feet high.
I'm going to ask you guys uh, if you want to uh, put a guess in the chat. How many times do you think this this uh, massive building has been moved in its lifetime, including this latest move that you saw? Just put down your guess in the chat if you want to, and I'll I'll review them at the end. So I'm going to show you um, one other video. This one's a little bit longer, just around three minutes, and uh, this is actually a 1923 mansion, uh, kind of like Bruce Wayne's manor, beautiful brick home that um, uh, about uh, 18 years ago had had about a $6.5 million interior renovation. And believe it or not, the owner um, had wanted to build a modern um, uh, architect design structure in place of this one. But thankfully, he uh, did not want to see the house go to waste. So um, the recipients of this house are a couple on Bainbridge Island and they paid only 200 and about $220,000 for this house. That included the move to Bainbridge Island and all of the barging, et cetera. So all they had to do once the house was received on the other side was to build the foundation underneath it. And a few years later, they were able to sell it for several million dollars, only buying it for around $220,000, if you can believe it. move this house, we uh, had to bridge over a 60 foot swimming pool. And that's what you see all the materials there on site. That's me up in the window there, putting up the banner. <laughs> oh, I just realized that bar just called the Sonia. <laughs> Sorry, the tugboat. This is what I call the money shot. So there are a lot of really unusual uses of uh, moved houses. And um, surprisingly, it can actually be very cost effective, especially when land is more affordable. And two examples of that are on um, both Orcas Island and also on San Juan Island. There are two nonprofits, in this case, the San Juan Preservation Trust, 
which has actually incorporated moved houses into their, their low income housing uh, charity. Uh, in this case, um, this is a community of 12 moved houses uh, and they have one other community that they're building up uh, with moved houses as well. And you'll notice that Nickel Brothers is able to combine multiple houses onto a barge to save on the delivery costs. I believe the top barge you can see has three houses and the lower barge has two houses. Um, it's actually um, uh, affordable because the majority of the house is already built. So once it's delivered, the house is put on cribbing. And then like I mentioned before, plumb lines are dropped from the corners of the house and the foundation is built underneath. So really the majority of the costs are the foundation and the hookups. And you can see what the finished products look like. They look like they've always been there. And uh, one thing that is also really beautiful about the concept of a moved house is that it's got soul, it's got character. There's a kind of that embodied energy that I think is a combination of not only the materials that were harvested to make the house, but also the, the design and the touches that the people who lived in the house, if they've cared for it well, how they've enhanced, modified and or um, improved or fixed the house over the years. And then of course they enjoy a whole new life in the case of a um, affordable income housing project like this one here. Uh, upcycling and wood recycling. This is something that, um, that I have been admiring about King County Solid Waste Division and some other uh, partners to uh, over many years develop the concept of a uh, wood reclamation center and a, a place where multiple industries can come together to uh, take advantage of salvaged materials. Um, salvaged wood is, is quite remarkable and there are companies um, throughout the country, including this example I found, uh, I believe it's in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, where they actually uh, will reclaim the wood and also provide a, a, a grading surface, service to grade the wood so that it can be used in building. And there's something that I learned from some of uh, Kenley Deller's con uh, 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 colleagues uh, at the Build Green Conference that in Washington state within the last couple of years, there's actually been a, um, a new code that's passed that allows certain um, uh, woods like Douglas fir and hemlock fir uh, to be have a base grade that is an assumed or prescriptive grade so that they can actually be used without a very expensive and challenging grading process at a prescriptive level. And so now, um, not many builders know this, but reclaimed wood can be used in certain even new construction projects. There's also long been the concept of having multiple wood reclamation partners in one, one center. And hopefully at the end, we'll be able to, to uh, have a little bit of a discussion process about some of those, those initiatives that are starting to come to fruition. But uh, Nickel Brothers has always been an advocate of this process. It kind of goes along with the triage approach that I've helped to pioneer because the houses often have to be stored for a waiting period while new permits are being um, approved at the receiving location. And one of the concepts that we've proposed to be part of a reclamation center is to potentially work on the houses while they're in storage. So maybe there's some new flooring put in, maybe there's a small addition or a dormer that's added. Maybe there's cabinetry that's, that's built and put in uh, with reclaimed wood. So uh, that's a partnership that we really want to, to keep tabs on and, and, and remain uh, part of. Uh, I'll leave you with one last thing I left you. I, I mentioned that, uh, that houses have been moved in all forms uh, throughout their history. And here's just kind of a fun little uh, example of a creative uh, structure move. I'm not sure if these are Amish or uh, Mennonite people, but uh, you can see that even without the power of machinery, very large structures can be moved. Not just horsepower, but person power.
stretching all the legs. So, um, Sonia, I'm going to stop my screen sharing and then um, let you introduce the questioning. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so, Jeff, a couple people did make guesses on your house moving. Um, it looks like we have a guess of three and ten. Can you let us know how many times that uh, building had been moved? Please. Whoever said three is exactly correct. That was, would be Kenley. All right, Kenley. It was moved uh, once from the warehouse or mill to the uh, uh, to the port of Seattle, um, and then moved to a different location in the port. And then, um, oh, actually, I guess we Nico Brothers was the third move. So yes, uh, so it was moved three times in total. Yeah, and it's an interesting fact. I'll I'll kind of weigh in on that. Um, House moving is not as well known in the Northwest as it is in the East Coast. Uh, you may have seen stories in the past of things like lighthouses being moved when the shoreline is eroding or various things like that. Um, it's not unusual if you look at an old New England house or especially a building that has historic character or value uh, like a, a famous person's house or, or a presidential house or whatever, maybe not presidential house, but, but sometimes, um, uh, historic structures have actually had a, a structural move at some point in their history. Part of it is because the age of, of homes is greater uh, on average on the East Coast. And I think also we've had kind of a more pioneering mentality in the Northwest. Um, there was plentiful forests to be able to take down our old growth trees and use them for, for cheap and quick building. And, um, and so it was kind of... Um, always thought of as, as a changing society. And I think as a result, uh, houses have not been thought of as as permanent as maybe the East Coast thinks of houses. So I'm gonna queue up a question that I have, um, and yeah. while well, maybe others are thinking of questions they have, um, what are the kind of timeline and logistical considerations um, of, you know, the standard sort of practice of demolition versus moving a house and sort of that how that impacts projects or maybe as a benefit. Yeah, so um, it's definitely the, the, the most common hesitation that I've experienced, especially from developers and to a lesser degree homeowners that, that um, want to see if their house can be saved. Uh, they worry, the developers worry that it will mean that their project will be delayed. And uh, one of the things that Nickel Brothers has always been very careful to say and to do is to commit to a certain date by which the house has to be removed from the site. Now, um, very early on, I helped to pioneer some uh, code within the city of Seattle, as an example, uh, where um, along with the building salvage and deconstruction industry, uh, moved houses are included in an option uh, as opposed to demolition. So a developer simply needs to change their permit wording to say house to be removed by house move. And it's exactly the same as a demolition permit with some different wording. Uh, now Nickel Brothers usually starts the marketing process to try to find a recipient for their homes um, months in advance, the earlier, the better. Um, and what Nickel Brothers promises the developer is that if the house is not off by that date, which is their anticipated permit date, then they can move to the next step, which would be building salvage and then potentially demolition. So it never slows a building project down. And really there are only upsides for the developer. There is not only the, the money savings and the environmental good, but there's actually a social good as well. And it can actually look very good, especially when a developer is considered green. Uh, it's truly being green when it is allowing a house to see if it has a chance to be moved. And not every house can be moved in time, but because a lot of the jurisdictions that I've commonly worked with have gotten a nice education process about how it can work, 
they've been very, very supportive of moved houses overall. So uh, there's a recent example in 2020 when there was a house um, on uh, up, uh, Lower Queen Anne, up in North, North Queen Anne, that was uh, right next door to a person that wanted to receive it on their property. So it was a developer that was gonna tear down a four square craftsman and the neighbor uh, um, wanted to receive the house. Now they had approached the developer and the developer was very gun shy about it and thought, well, gosh, it's taken us six months to even consider getting our permits. How can it possibly be permitted to move the house off the site in time? So I started working very closely with the SDCI all the way up to the director, Nathan Torvalson. Um, and uh, I was able to actually convince the one person in a development company that typically says no to everything, which is the attorney, the in-house attorney. And uh, he was convinced that it could be saved in time. And sure enough, we had promised that we could get it off within three weeks. And uh, the attorney got a call on his voicemail while he was in an elevator going to a deposition. And he literally out loud exclaimed, holy blank, that's Nathan Torgelson on my message machine saying that we can move the house in time. <laughs> so the point is that there can be um, uh, institutional and governmental support uh, when they understand the benefits of the waste reduction, the historic preservation, and the carbon capture that occurs by moving a house. And then I think from your experience, um, you know, with Nickel Brothers, and I'm sure there's other house moving companies out there who capitalize on this as well, but there's also maybe a social following to like look for these houses. There's a demand maybe. That's a very good point, Sonia. Um, Nickel Brothers has developed a fan following. Uh, this is a number of years ago, but there were uh, about 30,000 individual site visits per, uh, per month uh, to the Nickel Brothers website. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, Nina, one of, one of the Built Green team members, uh, saw my talk and uh, very quickly thereafter started going to nickelbros.com, N-I-C-K-E-L, like the coin, B-R-O-S.com and uh, became kind of a regular follower looking for houses that are listed for sale. Nickel Brothers does a very unusual thing. They actually proactively seek out houses that are being demolished, uh, contract the developer to be allowed to try to find a recipient for them. And then one of Nickel Brothers' many, many followers then decides to buy the house, uh, which basically is a dollar for the house and anywhere from about uh, 40,000 to 120,000 or more uh, for the house move, um, but it's still a lot cheaper than building um, from scratch, especially in places like the San Juan Islands where it's very expensive to build uh, because you get a lot of the development process sped up. And uh, it's surprising how many times if you're, oh, we have an Amber Alert, sounds like. Uh, especially uh, uh, when, um, uh, when they own land already, there's actual instant equity on their property once they add the house. All right. Well, we have two questions and just a few minutes left. So I'm going to handle those out of the chat. So Kinley asks, um, could you please talk just a little more about the ability to move houses over um, beaches, wetlands, etc.? cetera? Um, how big of an expense can be covered? And then lastly, how high of a bank, et cetera, um, or are there shoreline environmental impacts that have to be considered when moving a house? So Nickel Brothers has developed a methodology which has become kind of a gold standard for the house moving industry and has gone to many government conferences um, and kind of set some standards which have been adopted by different governments, especially in Canada where Nickel Brothers first started its business in 1956. Um, and uh, the methodology is, is a little bit like a military operation in the sense that they have 40 foot barge ramps and those ramps actually lock into um, an element of the barge. And then they span all the way across the foreshore past all of the eelgrass, all of the, um, the environmentally sen sensitive foreshore and, and uh, can very safely uh, circumnavigate the, 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 the very, um, important beaches that we need to make sure that we don't uh, damage. In terms of height above the land, uh, we have moved houses off of, of uh, barges uh, to a, a point as high as 18 feet banks in certain cases. Um, there are also methods that we can use kind of like what you saw with the East Lake House where there's skating that could be done 
um, in stages. So if a house is up on a high bank um, and there's maybe an in-between in stage that's halfway down, then sometimes it can be skated over that uh, kind of resting point about halfway down, lowered into kind of almost like a stair step, and then uh, either ramped down or skated off to a lower level on the shoreline. Those are more expensive to do, but in certain cases it merits doing if the house is actually worth saving and has a lot of value in it. Great. Um, last question for the day. Um, so Elizabeth is curious how common damage is in the course of a move. Um, and is there usually any repair work that needs to be done after a move? So that's a great question. And a lot of people assume that things like tiles will fall off of walls, windows will break, um, various things will shift. And it is true that the house moves around a little bit. But what a, one of the things that I've learned uh, is that I actually am a lot more confident now that I've been in the house moving business for a, a number of years uh, about even earthquakes. Um, what really is the most damage to a house in an earthquake is actually shifting off of the foundation. That's where the damage occurs. But in an actual shake, a wood frame house is actually able to withstand quite a bit of movement. And in a move, it's much less than an earthquake's uh, amount of uh, shaking. Um, one of the things that I would do with customers a lot is encourage them to put a, um, a wine glass half full of water on the table at the beginning of the move. And I guarantee that it will be there at the other end of the move. And there have been a couple of clients that have taken me up on that. And of course the wine glass is spilled all over the floor. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but uh, the reason that things don't break is that um, houses are inherently very, very strong because they're a box structure. And they've got lots of cross uh, members like walls interior to the house and things like that. Um, there is sometimes some surface plaster cracking, but the most of that occurs really when the house is being leveled and lifted for the first time in 100 years. That's actually when the most cracking occurs because over many decades, there have been small plaster repairs. And once it's level again for the first time in, in 70 or 100 years, then you sometimes reintroduce some of those cracks. So the most that I've ever seen is uh, some plaster patching, but other than that, it's, uh, it's pretty minor and those are usually in kind of corners of wide open areas and things like that. Well, great. Um, if anyone has any last minute questions, um, you're feel free to use the chat or turn on your video camera and use your mic. Um, otherwise we will wrap up this session. Thank you all who have attended and um, and definitely um, you can email me, uh, this last slide came up before, it's jeff at house to home, that's H-O-U-S-E-T-O-H-O-M-E dot org. And uh, you can email me if you have any follow-up questions um, or if you wanna learn a little bit more about house moving in general. Yeah, and um, just as a clarification, this uh, was not an endorsement of Nickel Brothers. It's just that Jeff has the most experience with their process and their firm. Um, there are other house moving uh, sources out there that I would recommend you contact should they be in an area that you're working in rather than maybe a local area. Um, thank you all for joining us today and we will conclude our webinar. Thank you.